Well, we're continuing the series of Bible studies that we're calling A Study of Some Psalms. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 19. So if you have your Bible, turn over to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. C.S. Lewis said about this psalm, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Most of us, if not all of us, have had the experience of looking up into the vastness of the night sky filled with uncountable numbers of stars, caught a glimpse of a meteor streaking across the sky, had the moon look like it could almost be touched. It looked so close and vivid. We've watched big fluffy clouds drift across a seemingly limitless sky been caught breathless by the stunning beauty of a sunset filling the sky with color. And in those kinds of moments, thoughts of God fill our hearts. Well, it was a moment like one of those that inspired David to begin writing Psalm 19. The psalm has three main parts. In the first part, Verses 1 through 6, David reflects on the glory of God revealed in the creation, and in particular, in the vastness of the heavens. In the second part, verses 7 through 11, David then reflects on the glory of God in the special revelation of his word, the scriptures that have been given to humanity. And in the final part, verses 12 through 14, having become aware of his own sin and vulnerability in the presence of of such glory, David responds by asking the Lord to forgive and to purify him. The psalm ends not with David seeing the Lord as his accuser and judge condemning him because of his sin. Instead, he sees the Lord as his rock and redeemer, his place of safety and his rescuer, his savior, his champion. So let's go up to verse 1 of the psalm and begin looking at it. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. I'd like to begin by pointing out that the language being used in this psalm is poetic, not scientific. Sometimes well-intentioned people lose out on the glory that they ought to see in a passage of Scripture like this because they're trying too hard to make it fit into a modern scientific understanding of the physical universe. Don't do that. David didn't write this psalm to teach science. David wrote this psalm to show how the creation reveals the majesty and the power of God. The psalm is intended to provoke worship in the hearts of the readers. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. The glory of God is seen in the vastness of space. There is a feeling of infinity when we look up into the sky, whether it's the daytime or the nighttime. Our eyes never reach the end of the heavens. Our eyes never reach the end of the skies. We've invented mechanical eyes to help us peer many times further than our natural eyes can look. And yet, even with these powerful telescopes, we have never reached the end of the heavens. The Lord is more vast than all of it. He made the heavens. He exists outside the heavens. The vastness of the heavens, which we have never seen the end of, can't contain the Lord. Verse 2, he says, Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Day after day, night after night, the endless cycle of day and night and seasons reminds us of the eternity of God. In the first two verses here, we have the vast limitness of space and the apparent endlessness of time proclaimed by the creation. God is bigger than everything, and God has lasted longer than everything. Before space 
he was. Before time, he was. When the end of space is reached, he will still be beyond it. When time comes to an end, he will still be there. Space and time, which he created, proclaim his infinite, eternal nature. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, referring to the vastness of the heavens and the creation, the universal nature of this declaration, this speech, this display, this presentation. Everyone understands it. It's for all people to know and understand. There is no people group excluded. There's no age group excluded. There's no culture group excluded. In verse 4 he says, Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The voice of the heavens, speaking of the glory of God, goes out into all the earth. It reaches every place, everywhere. There's no one on this planet who has not received the message of God's glory proclaimed in the heavens. In Romans 1.20, Paul makes the same point that every human being everywhere on this planet who has ever lived has seen and understood God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature through the observable creation. In verse 3 and 4, we are reminded of the omnipresence of God, that He is everywhere present all the time, and we're reminded that God wants to communicate with all of us, every single one of us. Verse 4, the second part of it, it says, In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. So now the poet, David, he focuses his lens on a single heavenly body and how it proclaims the glory of God. The heavenly body that is focused on is the sun, the most dominant of all of the heavenly bodies when viewed from our vantage point of earth. There's other heavenly bodies in space that are larger than our sun when measured in absolute units. But from where we are standing on the surface of the earth, looking up into the sky, there is no heavenly body that has the magnitude and the power and the influence that the sun does. The sun, it makes up 99.8% of the mass of our solar system. That means that all of the other planets, all of the planets, all the asteroids, all of the various bits of space, debris, and junk, and dust combined together only make up 0.2% of the mass of our solar system. The sun is everything else. It takes about a million Earths to make up the volume of one sun. It's said that in one second, the sun generates more energy than has been used in all of humankind throughout history. The overwhelming dominance of the sun in our sky reminds us of the omnipotence of our great God. Nothing in our sky compares to the sun. Nothing anywhere compares to the power of the Lord. The mighty sun is, 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 is talked about here as parading across the sky from when end of it to the other, every day, unceasingly. It never tires, it never dims, it is always full of vigor and strength for its task. And again, the Lord is more faithful, more untiring, more radiant, more vigorous than the sun. He made the sun. It says in verse 6, nothing is deprived of its warmth, or there is nothing hidden from its heat. The sun's heat literally powers everything on our planet. Everything. The sun's heat could easily cook us, but we've been placed at just the right distance from this gigantic furnace so that we are warmed but not burned. The sun's heat drives our oceans, waves, and currents, and the winds, and the weather of our skies. 
The sun's heat drives the hydrologic system of our planet. This amazing cycle of precipitation and evaporation, which distributes fresh, nourishing water across our globe and purifies that water to be used again and again and again. The sun's heat drives the photosynthesis process of the plants, which is an integral part of the oxygen generation system of our planet and the water purification system of our planet and the food production system of our planet. The sun directly provides light for our day and indirectly light for our night as it reflects its light off of the moon down to us. It's not surprising that the ancient cultures worshipped the sun as a god when we see the overwhelming influence that this single heavenly body has on our planet. But the sun, this amazing heavenly engine, is a created thing rather than the creator itself. It serves to highlight for us the power of God of which the sun is inferior in comparison. Think of the power of the sun and all that it accomplishes on this planet for us, and then ask yourself, is there anything in my life too hard for the Lord? And as it says, nothing is deprived of the sun's warmth, which with it providing energy and light and life for everything on our planet, so... The Word of God provides energy and light and life for all who embrace it and allow it to speak into their life. And this leads us to this second part of the psalm in verse 7. He writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. In this second major part of the psalm, David reflects on the glory of God in the special revelation of the scriptures. The God who created all of the vast heavens has spoken to us in the sounds and the symbols that we use to communicate with each other. Our language. There is a beautiful act of love and a desire for relationship that is inherent in the fact that the scriptures exist. The great God has spoken with us in a personal and direct way. There is a general and universal communication of the creation, but then there is also this personal and direct communication to us in the Word of God. So David uses six different terms here in these verses verses 7 through 9, to refer to the Word of God. They each highlight a slightly different aspect of the Lord's Word given to us. At the same time, these terms can be used interchangeably with each other to refer to the Word of God. See, the idea is not to try to decide what is a statute versus a precept versus a command, but to take all of these terms collectively to get a grander view of all that the Word of God is. Well, these six terms are law, statutes, precepts, commands, fear, and decrees. Law, or Torah, as the Hebrew says, is a comprehensive term that's used to refer to God's revealed will for us contained in the Scriptures. Statutes, also in verse 7, or testimony, it emphasizes God's declaration of what is true. Precepts in verse 8, or instructions, it emphasizes the precision of the directions given by God. Commands, also in verse 8, emphasizes the authority of God in his word. Fear, verse 9, it's, it's interesting that David uses the word fear as a synonym for the word of God. You might remember that the fear of the Lord means to have this deep respect and reverence for the Lord. 
So fear emphasizes the human response of awe and reverence that's produced by God's word. And then finally, decrees in verse 9, or decisions, it emphasizes the judgments or the evaluations that God has made about our actions. The benefits and blessings of the Word of God are given in these verses 7 through 11. And in the first uh, uh, group of verses 7 through 9, they're, they're given in pairs of an aspect or quality of the Word of God and then a blessing of the Word of God. These pairs, they don't always have obvious connection with each other, nor do I think it's necessary to identify a direct connection between them, take them for what they are, rather than trying to connect them together and force something that may not be in the text. And then in the second group, verses 10 and 11, there's a slightly different pattern that David uses to highlight the goodness and the blessings of the Word of God. But let's go up to verse 7, and we'll work our way through these verses and take a look at each of these things that are said about the Word of God. So in verse 7, it begins, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect. It's flawless. It's free from fault or defect or mistakes. In Psalm 12, 6, it says, the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Verse 7, it says, the law of the Lord refreshes the soul. We're reminded in Psalm 23, 2, when we looked at it, where it says, the Lord refreshes our soul. The word of God has this restorative quality, healing and renewing us. The initial impact of the Word of God upon us is not always easy to receive, is it? I mean, it can be difficult to hear. It can knock the wind out of us, humbling us, challenging us, confronting our attitudes and our behaviors. But there is a healing, a restoring of soul that takes place when we encounter the Word of God. It says in verse 7, the second half of it says, "...the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy." The Word of God can be trusted, it can be depended on, it can be relied on. The statutes of the Lord make me wise. Psalm 119, 98, it says, Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Verse 8 says, the precepts of the Lord are right. The basic meaning of the word that's translated right refers to something that is straight or level or smooth. The word of God is right as opposed to being crooked. There's something tremendously satisfying and settling about something being straight and level. And just the opposite is also true about something that is crooked or cockeyed. It's, it's like a splinter in your brain. It can drive you nuts. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. So rather than the Lord's precepts being a burden, they are just the opposite for his people. They give us joy. There's a settling, a satisfying, fulfilling, peace-producing, joy-creating quality to the Word of God. Second part of verse 8, it says, the commands of the Lord are radiant. The Word of God illuminates, it brings light, it enlightens, it gives understanding. The Hebrew word translated radiant, it can also have the aspect of something that is pure or clear or bright. The commands of the Lord give light to the eyes. Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Verse 9, verse 9, it says, The fear of the Lord is pure. That word translated pure, it means something that is free of defilement. It's morally pure and clean. The word of God is undefiled. It's the purest of pure. It comes directly from the source, capital S, source. The fear of the Lord endures forever. The word of God is eternal. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. See, the very nature of our being is temporary. The word of God is just the opposite. In contrast, it endures forever. What is certain in this world? 
one thing, the Word of God. Verse 9, the decrees of the Lord are firm. The Word of God is solid and secure. It's a foundation, a bedrock upon which we can build our life. Do you remember the parable that Jesus told about the wise and foolish builders? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. The Word of God is only a firm foundation for our life if we put it into practice. The person who doesn't follow the Word of God is like a, the foolish man in this parable who built his house on the sand. They will not endure. Verse 9 says, the decrees of the Lord, all of them, are righteous. Every single part of the Word of God is righteous. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then we get to verse 10, which is this second grouping within this um, second part of the psalm where it says, the words of God are more precious than gold, much pure gold. Gold was the most valued commodity in the world at the time that David wrote this psalm. And so, he is saying the word of God is the most valuable thing in the world. He says the words of God are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. The most deliciously sweet-tasting thing in the world that David lived in was honey. I don't see honey served straight from the honeycomb here in our country very much. But when Sharon and I were in Turkey a couple of years ago, one of the things regularly offered at the buffets were these large honeycombs dripping with honey. It was awesome. It was delicious. The Word of God is sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. The Word of God is delicious and enticing to the soul. Verse 11, by the words of God we are warned. The Word of God, it's preventative. It helps us avoid troubles, warns us about paths not to take. There's an old saying that maybe you're familiar with that says, stupid hurts meaning stupid choices and behaviors bring consequences of pain and suffering. By following the Word of God, we can avoid the pain and the suffering brought on by stupid. Finally, verse 11 closes with, In keeping the Word of God, there is great reward, considering all of the blessings and the benefits of the Word of God. Indeed, there is great reward in it. This brings us to the third and final portion of the psalm, beginning in verse 12, where it says, But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So following this reflection on the creation and the word of God, the poet David is reminded of his sin and weakness and vulnerability. There is also a beautiful expression of trust in the Lord, though he is not cringing in a corner here, afraid that this God will break out against him and squish him like a bug. Instead, there is a trust, a a confidence, a peace in knowing that the Lord knows all. Rather than running from God, David says, I want to be pleasing to you, Lord. And so verse 12, it says, but who can discern their own errors? 
Forgive my hidden faults. It's surprising, isn't it, how unaware we can be about our own sins. Sometimes we're not aware that what we have been thinking and doing is even wrong. We suffer from simple ignorance. There are things that I didn't know were displeasing to God until his word made those things known to me as sin. Sometimes, though, we we know a certain way of thinking or acting is wrong. We recognize it in other people easy enough. But when it comes to ourself, we have a blind spot or we justify it. Human beings are skilled at creating one set of rules for ourselves and another set of rules for everybody else. David, he asked the Lord to forgive him for the sins which are hidden, whether they are sins of ignorance or sins that David is blind to in himself. 13, it says, Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. He asked the Lord to keep him from committing willful sins. Sins. These are the kinds of sins uh, that we know are wrong, the kinds of things we know are wrong, and we choose to do them anyway. May they not rule over me or reign or have dominion or have control over me. What an honest and humble prayer this is by David. He prays that these willful sins will not rule over him. They'll not control him. They'll not have their way with him these things that he wants to do, even though he knows they're against what God wants him to do, he prays that he will not do those things. This is where the rubber meets the road with obedience to the word of God, though, isn't it? It's not difficult to obey the Lord when it's something that we have no interest in doing anyway. But it's not so easy to obey the Lord when obedience requires that we deny ourselves something that we really want to do. He says, then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression. So when I have been forgiven of all my sins, even those that I am unaware of that I have done, and when I have had my heart's desire changed so that willful sins don't rule over me, then I will be blameless, as the psalmist says here, an upright person, innocent of great transgression against the Lord. Verse 14, he says, May these words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. See, this brings us back around to the beginning of the psalm, where in the first verses, the vast creation declares the glory of God. It proclaims the work of his hands. It pours forth speech. David now, he says, he wants his own words and life to do the same, to declare, to proclaim, to, for, to pour forth speech that glorifies the Lord. And this meditation of my heart, may it be pleasing in your sight. David, he wants not only the visible and audible parts of his life to be pleasing to God, but he wants the invisible parts of his life, the meditation of his heart, to be pleasing to the Lord. And he closes with, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The psalm ends here not with David seeing the Lord as his accuser and judge, condemning him because of his sin. Instead, David comes to the Lord. He sees the Lord as his rock and his redeemer, his place of safety and protection, and his rescuer, his savior, his champion. And so the psalm ends that way. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this psalm that is a beautiful, poetic declaration of your glory, both in the creation and in the specific, personal, direct revelation that you have given us through your scripture, your word, Lord, that we have here before us. And God, we too are reminded like David that we are people in need of rescue and redemption.
And we cry out to you, our great rescue, our, our great savior, our great champion. We pray, God, as David did, that we pray that our life and the meditations of our heart, Lord, that our life would proclaim, declare, pour forth speech that glorifies you in the same way the rest of the creation does, Lord. May you be glorified in us, in Jesus' name, amen.